So we're going to solve some differential equations, particularly application problems. But before we get to the application problems, we just need to talk in general about solving a differential equation. So if they give us y prime is equal to 2x over y, and they ask us to solve that equation, they're wanting to know, well, what is the original equation for y? So I think it's easiest to look at this uh, in Leibniz notation, dy over dx, because when we integrate this, our variables have to agree. We've got to have the same variables um, on uh, each side. We can't mix x's and y's. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my y's on one side, typically the left side, and I want my x terms on the same side, usually the right side. So I'm going to multiply both sides by y, so that cancels on the right side. I'm going to multiply both sides by dx, so that cancels on the left side. So we have y dy is equal to 2x dx. Now we can integrate both sides. Use a different color, 2x dx. Integrate both sides. So the antiderivative of y is y squared over 2. And the antiderivative of 2x is just x squared you only need to put the plus C on one side, and we typically put it on the side with the X. Okay, so I don't have to put the plus C on the Y side. Um, just because if I put it on both sides, technically it's going to cancel out, but we still need it there. Okay, we can't let that cancel out. Um, now, it just depends. Sometimes they leave the answer like that. Sometimes they'll try and solve completely for Y. So... Um, this could be how your answer choices look, or they could solve for y by multiplying both sides by 2 to get rid of that divided by 2. So we get 2x squared. Multiplying c by 2 is still going to give us a constant. So a lot of times in the book you may see them write it as c sub 1. It's still a constant. You really don't need the subscript. Uh, that's just them indicating that Technically, we multiply by something there. Um, and if we are trying to solve completely for y, we would take the square root. Now, don't forget when you take the square root to include the positive and the negative. To include the positive and the negative. So this would be um, another form of a general solution to this differential equation. So they may solve it completely for y, or they may leave it in the y squared over 2 form. It just depends. What do you mean you worry about it? I mean, you just leave it there. <laughs> Technically, but it really doesn't matter. It really, really doesn't matter. Um, on the AP exam, they would just have a C. Um, now, something that I want to mention with these square root problems. If, after this, they ask you about a particular solution, and they give you the initial condition that y equals negative 9 when x equals 2, I don't even know that that would work out perfectly. Okay, I'm just giving you an example here then when you solve for c, since y is negative, your particular solution is going to end up being y is equal to the negative square root of 2x squared plus whatever you figure out for the c. Because the y was negative, then your particular solution just has the negative square root. If your y was positive, then your particular solution would just have the positive square root. Make sense? Okay. Yeah, the negative would still be in front of the 9. Yeah, yeah, it would. Well, I mean, it's going to end up canceling out. When you, when you solve, like, negative 9 is equal to the negative square root of 2x squared plus c1, then... 
you know, the negatives would cancel, you'd square it, 2x squared plus c1, so forth and so on. Okay? All right, so let's get into our application problems, okay? In many applications, the rate of change of a variable y is proportional to the value of y. When y is a function of time t, the proportion can be written like this. dy over dt is equal to k times y. Okay? The rate of change of y, that's dy over dt, the rate of change, is proportional to, so that's where the co where the k comes from, the value of y. Okay, so that's where that equation comes from. So let's find the general solution to this differential equation. So we have dy over dt is equal to k times y. Okay, we need y on the same side and we need everything else on the other side. So in this case, We've got to divide by y or multiply by 1 over y, however you want to look at it, to move that y on the right side. And then that dt needs to be on the other side, so we need to multiply both sides by the dt. So what we've got right now is 1 over y dy is equal to k dt. k is just a constant. It's our proportionality constant. So now we're going to do what we did in the last problem. We're going to integrate both sides. What's the antiderivative of 1 over y? The natural log of y. Now, because we don't know anything about y, technically we need to put some absolute value bars around it just in case it's a negative. Now, k is a constant. So the antiderivative of k with respect to t would be k times t. A and uh, plus C. Now, we need to solve for Y. Right now, Y is inside of a natural log. So, how do we, do y'all remember how we get something out of a natural log? We need to write it in exponential form. Okay, the base of the natural log is E. So, in exponential form, that says E to the KT plus C is equal to y. Now, I can drop the absolute value bars here because e to a power is always positive unless there's something else in front of it, and there's not in this case, but e raised to a power is always positive, so I can drop those absolute value bars. Um, now, there's one more thing that we need to do to this. Let's use some properties of exponents. Okay, if we're adding in the exponent, technically that means that uh, in the step before that, we were multiplying. Okay, I'm just kind of decomposing that using my properties of exponents. It makes more sense if we go from the last line that I had to the previous line. E to the kt times e to the c, we add those exponents. Okay, so I'm just going backwards. E raised to a constant is a constant. So here is our general solution for these problems. It is y is equal to c, technically I'll put a sub 1 there, you really don't necessarily need the sub 1, times e to the k times t. Check and put the equal. Okay? In this case, c is always the initial value. c is always our initial value. K is our proportionality constant. When that K is bigger than zero or positive, we're experiencing exponential growth. When it's less than zero or negative, then it's always decay. All right. So, uh, first of all, let's just look at kind of a plain problem here. Not much context. We are told the rate of change of y is proportional to y. So that means we can use all the work that we just did. 
So that means y equals c times e to the kt. This is the formula that we're going to be using because that's exactly what we just looked at. The rate of change of y is proportional to y so that we don't have to redo that every single time. All right, so when t equals 0, y equals 2. When t equals 2, y equals 4, what is the value of y when t equals 3? So let's plug in those specifics here. y equals 2 when t is 0. So that's nice. 0 times k is 0. e to the 0 is 1. So that says 2 is our c. So when we set up the next one, y equals 4, when t equals 2, we can use what we just figured out, that c is equal to 2. Otherwise, we would have too many variables. So we divide both sides by 2, 4 divided by 2 is 2, e to the 2k, how do we solve for that variable? Mm, natural log of 2 is equal to 2k. And divide both sides by 2. So sometimes they'll um, give you the they'll give you the uh, exact value. Sometimes they'll use a uh, decimal value, so let's just go ahead and get us a decimal approximation, 0.346. It's approximately our K. So our particular solution here says that Y is equal to C is 2, E to the K is 0.346, T, that's our particular solution for this scenario. So when they want to know what's the value of y when t is 3, we can plug in 3. And into our particular solution. Now, I have that in my calculator, so I'm just going to use it. Times 3, e raised to that power, times 2. So y is approximately 5.656 when t equals 3. Let's look at an actual application problem. Radioactive decay. Now we did these in pre-calc uh, with half-lives. So that is one way to look at this problem. But we're going to look at it in a slightly different perspective here. 10 grams of the plutonium isotope 239 uh, were released in a nuclear accident. How long will it take for the 10 grams to decay to 1 gram? And they tell us the half-life of this plutonium. So radioactive decay follows the same uh, growth and decay model. So we're still looking at our general equation, y equals c e to the kt. So let's look at what we know. We start with 10 grams. C is always our initial value. So we can plug that in. So we know that much. We've got to use this half-life idea somewhere. Okay? In 24,100 years, how much of that 10 grams would be present? Five. So let's use that. Five grams is equal to the 10 times e to the k times 24,100. This is going to allow us to solve for k. So divide by 10. 5 over 10 is 1 half. 
write it logarithmic form, then ask log 1 half is equal to 24,100 times k divided